Uh, I'd just like to begin uh, with a quick scenario. Um, just run this by you all real fast. Picture your bank in your mind. Uh, for many of us, this may not exactly be a happy thought, you know, we screw these guys. Um, <laughs> There's likely several brick and mortar branches for your particular uh, bank in that area. However, being tech folks, um, I don't suppose it's a stretch to say we probably all do a lot of online banking, right? Um, imagine when you went to your bank's wonderful website, I uh, entered in your information, logged in successfully. Um, I typed in bank website, and this is the first image I could find. Um, <laughs> and upon li logging in, you, you click the link to check your balance. Uh, in doing so, you're presented with a screen that just shows you balance $100, but with no context around that number. Uh, that may be fine if you expected it to be hundred, uh, $100. But what if the balance was negative and you weren't expecting that? What happened to the Christmas check from grandma that should have cleared by now, right? What if that's all your bank balance was? Just a simple number, just a simple row in the database. And what if that was all your bank could tell you? Um, they couldn't tell you how it got there, when it got there, or what the value is. All they know is what they think the value is right now. You know, how angry would you be, right? <laughs> Can you imagine the arguments you'd have with the teller? You like, well, <laughs> about the negative $100? Um, luckily, that's not how things are done. Uh, banks store your account's entire history. Every transaction you make with the bank, every credit or debit you made is logged, along with an audit trail of who, which teller, for example, made that change. Uh, to get your balance, the bank simply adds up each of these transactions. Um, they may also period period periodically record what the balance was at a specific point in time to prevent having to recalculate everything from the beginning of the log. Um, there's a certain advantage to this idea uh, that we can record all modifications to our data, in this case the credits and the debits, um, as events that occur within our system. For, for example, your bank is able to tell you exactly how they arrived at your account balance. What about your company software? Can you tell your users or your internal business team how you're arriving at the, da the data that you're presenting to, to uh, the world. Um, so today, I'm gonna present a, a method that helps you do this. Uh, it's called uh, event sourcing. Uh, my name is Steve. Uh, I work for a startup called Third Channel in Boston. Uh, and uh, today, we got a I got a lot to cover. There's, there's a lot of information here. I'm very energetic about this subject, so I'm gonna try and get through it all. We'll see if I can. Uh, I'm, gonna I'm gonna start with just going over the basics of what event sourcing is. Uh, some of the challenges that you're going to run into, because it's pretty complicated. Uh, talk about why it's worth it. Talk about how you query this mess. Uh, talk, and then we'll go over some, some implementation details. Uh, talk about some tools. Uh, and if I have time, which I probably won't, uh, show, some, show some example code. Um, so first, what is event sourcing? And basically, it's an alternative storage pattern for your data. Or rather, it's an alternative to the standard ORM storage mapping. So uh, if, you, you know, if you're using GORM, for example, and you have your domain object, uh, you, your, each of your objects is mapped directly to one row within the database. Uh, you know, the, the, the first name property on the domain object is the first name column in your database. Um, and, you th and this method is fine, but the, the only thing uh, that you know about your data is what it looks like right now. And so what event sourcing says is, you know, that's fine, but we're gonna do something a bit different. Instead of storing the current state of our models, we're going to store facts about our models. Every successful user interaction generates a series of facts or events within our system. This stream of events uh, are, persisted, are persisted in our database in the order they occurred as a journal of what has transpired. Uh, these events can then be played back against our domain object, building it up to the state that it would be at any given point in time. Most often, this will be the current state but we could look at it, uh, what it looked like last Tuesday, for example. Uh, a stream of events represents a particular object in aggregate. And that's one of the key terms when, uh, to, to know when talking about event sourcing. Um, that and, of course, the event. So an event uh, represents something that has occurred within your system. Uh, the past tense is important when uh, describing them. Uh, it, it represents an intentional user action or the result of a user action uh, that almost always uh, results in the manipulation uh, or state change of an object. It doesn't have to. You can capture uh, just actions that users are doing that may or may not uh, affect an actual uh, domain object or something like that. Uh, things like bank account opened uh, or uh, currency deposited are uh, decent names for events. The objects which are affected by events are referred to as an aggregate. Uh, they generally serve as a root uh, for a stream of events, you'll sometimes hear the term root aggregate. 
Um, they represent the state of an event stream in aggregate. I'm gonna keep using that word, that term until it settles in. Um, and when you're just starting out with this, it's easy to, uh, to think of them as something analogous to a domain model in Grails or an entity in, in, uh, in JPA. It doesn't have to be, though. Uh, it can be, say, relationships between objects. Um, for example, um, in my company, we, we model the assignment uh, relationship between our users, uh, the state they are within the program, and what programs they're in um, as, as all one aggregate, along with many other things. Um, event sourcing, and this is the other key, uh, another uh, key point, uh, perhaps the biggest. It's a purely additive model. There is no delete, nor is there an update of an event. If you're doing this right, you could put it on a read, on, read once media and uh, still, still, still succeed. Um, events are immutable once written to our journal. And this is a powerful notion if you consider the implications. Using event sourcing, no data is ever lost or ever ignored. Um, now, when I, when I need to retrieve information about my aggregates, I simply play back all of the events that have occurred in the past in order to build up the data to any point in time, generally the current, the current time, uh, thus getting the current state of our data. And one of the key points, um, by maintaining all events, we're able to access the current state of our aggregates, again, or objects. Um, we can also access the state uh, of the data or aggregates at any point in time. Uh, I mentioned that before, it's a huge point, which I'm gonna keep repeating again. Um, now, I'm sure some of you are thinking, you know, wait a minute, if I never get rid of anything, that has to have trade-offs too, right? Specifically performance. What happens if I have thousands or even millions of events that I need to apply? Right, and that's a very good observation. Luckily, uh, event sourcing recommends an early optimization known as snapshots. And a snapshot is just what you'd think it would be. It's a recording of, of the details of your aggregate at that moment in time, persisted forever. So as we consume and create events, periodically we persist a snapshot containing the state, the full state of the aggregate at that point in time. Um, when replaying events, we would load from the most recent snapshot and then apply only, only the events between when that snapshot was taken and, and the targeted date. So in this case, um, I have you know, 23 events, or no, 25 events. I took a snapshot at event 23. If I want to get the current state, I don't have to go and replay all these events. I can load up the snapshot at 23 and then just play those, la those last two events. Um, we'll get into some more specifics around snapshots in a bit. Um, but quick, I'll do a little example. Um, suppose we were building an e-commerce app and we were building the shopping cart. In, uh, in your naive, standard, ORM relational uh, way, you know, I could uh, build this out such that it's, you know, I have a, uh, like a line item in my database that maps the product ID to the quantity that the user's got in their cart, uh, along with the particular price. Um, which is, in, you know, if I'm pulling this out of the database, you know, it'll, you know, I can just, just rip it out and it looks fine or whatever, but with, with event sourcing, each of these components um, would, uh, would not be saved as a single row, but rather as a series of events. So I would record things like uh, when the cart was created, when the product was added to, to the user's cart, when the product was, uh, well, I guess when other products were added. I made this slide a while ago, so I forget exactly what the words are on here. But um, essentially what I'm doing in this, in, the event, in this event example is adding uh, a series of products at various quantities, removing them, and then removing them from the cart, and then finally placing the order. Um, the data backing the view that we see for the, for the user's current state of their cart is built, is built up from the events uh, to form an object intended for view. Um, but it doesn't, show, it doesn't show all the events, necessarily. It shows the, the end result of what happened when you, when you played. So it doesn't show, for example, the, the products that the user removed. But we have that information in case we need it later. Um, the data backing the view is built up from the events to form the object. Uh, one key important thing to, to, to note is that this object uh, that, we're, that we're displaying to the user from the view is transient. So the current, the current state of the shopping cart has no direct representation on disk. It's, again, saved as a series of, series of events. When I'm done with the view, this particular object will disappear and be garbage collected. And that's another, uh, that's another key point, working with objects. Question? It's a great question. So uh, the question was, when I'm replaying the events, am I redoing the business logic or just, or just a delta? Th that I, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna cover that in a minute. Typically, you do the deltas, but if it's a new event, you might have some business logic. So if I'm placing an order, I might record the event that the order was placed, 
if I'm looking back in time, I can certainly build that back up. But the first time that event happens, I might have a side effect which actually builds the client, which I don't necessarily want to happen again when I'm playing the event back, but uh, the first time I do. And so there's that, that's an important distinction to make when you're working with events, is that is this a new event or is this a, a historical event? It's a great question. Um, anyway, I think, let's see what, uh, tra yeah, transient objects. And I, I think this is where event sourcing starts to hurt your brain. Uh, in order to fully grasp what it is, it's important to realize that the objects that you work with are transient derivatives of your event stream. Um, and they are ephemeral and must be built up uh, from the events uh, to be used in a, in a traditional manner within your application. Finally, uh, I argue that structuring our data in this way is akin to the way our brains work. It's natural. Internally, your mind is able to tell you the current state of your knowledge about things. This current state is formed by a series of observations, facts, events from your past. You're able to replay these events in your mind and also remember your knowledge at any given point in time. Uh, but our minds aren't perfect, and sometimes we forget things. Um, that violates a yes. Um, let's take me, for example. Even if you've never seen or met me before today, your mind has already recorded a series of facts which is driving your mental model for me. For example, you, can, you, know, you could have a feature observed event. Notice my hair color. Notice my gender. Notice the fact that right now I'm giving a presentation because I'm wearing a red shirt and I might be speaking too fast. Um, and that this forms your current representation of Steve. And you might be thinking, you know, well, he seems like a nice guy, but if I were to suddenly make a rude gesture to you guys right now, um, you'd be like, man, Steve was pretty cool until he flipped this all off. What a, what a jerk. But you could remember before I did that that you thought I was pretty nice. Um, this may be a bit early, but there, are there any questions that I can start? Because there's a lot of information right away. Go ahead. That's, that, 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 that's a great question. So uh, the question was, if I'm placed in that order, but I have, a, uh, and if I've snuck in some other events, is it, is it gonna re uh, uh, re accept the fact that those other events showed up there? Um, it's a great question, and I think if you were to implement that, you would, when the order place event occurs, before you actually you know, build the customer, do the other side effect business logic, you would, uh, in a transaction at that point, look and see what all the current objects you have in the cart uh, are, and then you know, b base it on that. Um. If you, you, you would need to do that. You need to execute that operation by, by uh, loading lo right before this side effect occurs to build the user, load the current state of their shopping cart at that moment. And so hopefully you would accrue any events that are coming in from various sources before this event occurs. Anything else? Yes. Sure. Nope. I mean, you, you could. There is, I think, uh, I think Kafka works that way, which I'll get into a little bit. I think it deletes, uh, it, it takes a periodic snapshot, and I think it deletes uh, 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 older events. Um, I, th I think it's up to your personal preference. I say no, because then it's hard to go back and look at what the, 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 the system was at, uh, in, in between snapshots. Everything forever, which, uh, which is, uh, I think, is a, is a good transition into the next section, uh, da, 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 da. Um, which I call, I think I get what you're laying down, but that seems bananas, <laughs> right? You, you, you're going to be suspicious, right? You're going to be thinking, this seems like a ton of extra work. I mean, I have to assert the current state of my cart before I'm, uh, before I'm billing the user, or you know, it's got to be ton of, it's gonna be a ton of resource overhead, right? Because I've got to you know, keep track of everything. Um, and uh, it, how do I even make good use of these snapshots if I'm trying to you know, process a million records? Or where do my models go? You know, I can't live without my MVC. You know, I miss my standard model view controller. And yeah, those, those, those are all true. Um, and he, here's some more bad things. 
So there's more storage required. You're gonna, you, because we never delete anything, you've got to keep that stuff around forever. Your database is going to start looking a little bit cluttered, right? And you're going to repeatedly ask yourself, why the heck are we keeping all this stuff around? Who's going to go back and look at those old books anyway, right? Um, and this is a truly difficult one, I think. Uh, you have reduced database level constraints. Uh, depending on what type of database you're using, which I'll get to in a minute, um, we may have reduced constraints on things like foreign keys and null checks, neat checks, things like that. Instead, we have to rely on our software for transactions uh, and those database constraints. And so, especially if you're in something like, like Rails or, or Spring, you make heavy use of transactional blocks. Um, Finally, uh, this can be difficult for some of the junior engineers uh, on your team. Um, and I've noticed that people really, really cling to that model view controller way of life. Uh, and they, they can find it difficult to transition to, uh, to, a, to a different pattern. Um, and this is a very different way of building applications, at least at the persistence level, uh, particularly for you know, this, your, your people who are used to working with something like a Grails or a Spring. Um, and telling people that their views become a transient object derived from the event stream will scare them. So as crazy as this all might sound, I argue that event sourcing actually has huge benefits. So don't worry, yes, it's worth it. First, um, I, it's, it's more than an audit log. Uh, so you know, I'm keeping track of everything. It may be, you may think, oh, hey, I can, I, can, uh, I, can, I, I certainly get a, get, a, get a list of everything that's happened. But why couldn't I just you know, log everything to disk? or to a, to, a, to, a, to a log file or something like that. Why do I need to build an actual event uh, thing within my, within my platform? Um, and there's a subtle difference, I think, between an audit log and an event stream. Audit logs tell the history of what happened to your system or what, it, or what was persisted to the database. And events tell the intent of history of what the user was, has done or what, what they tried to do. Um, furthermore, having the events as a first order member of your platform can give you enhanced information around what your users or systems are doing beyond what might normally get written to the database. Uh, you can make events that don't necessarily deal with the properties changed by a user, but additional actions that may have occurred. And it's vastly easier to work with and analyze the data if the events are integrated within your platform already. But ES is also a perfect audit log, because every event attaches, if it, if it, has, if it can get that information, the user that made that change. Data storage is cheap. Last I looked, uh, AWS basic SSD storage was something like uh, 0.1 cents per gigabit hour. And I don't, I probably should have done the calculations. I don't know what that is per month, but it seems really low. Um, and if you get to the point where those pennies matter, then your business probably has much bigger issues at the moment. <laughs> what I find interesting is that this, this, going back to this whole point about this being a natural approach, uh, is that event sourcing or some non-digital analog of it is used by every mature or long-running business. So banks, for example. Um, this went over in the beginning, but banks uh, and accounting methods operate with event sourcing. Bankers additionally even use snapshots of your balance as an additional column beyond the credits and debits. Uh, lawyers. So if a contract needs to be adjusted, is the contract thrown out and rewritten? Rather, uh, addendums are placed under the contract at the end. And so if you need to figure out what this contract actually says, you have to read the first thing and then read each successful ad addendum to build up you know, the mental model of what this contract is actually trying to say. All business problems can be successfully modeled with this, with this approach and benefit greatly by it. Um, how many of you have, er, uh, have delete statements in your code? Yeah? Yeah. Who doesn't, right? Get rid of stuff. Even if you don't, every time you update a row or a database and overwrite some column, you've just lost information. You don't know how that data got there. So remember, there is no delete. Event sourcing is the only structural model that does not lose information. Event sourcing simplifies testing and debugging. This is a bold claim, I know. But using test events, um, or unit, we, we can unit test events to make sure that the properties that we expect to change changes. We can test our individual functions that, you know, for first side effect, things like that. And then we can assert in integration tests that things that the events happened um, and, and are written. Um, in addition, debugging is easy because we're, we can effectively time travel within our platform. We can look back through our aggregates timelines and examine them at any point in history. I can see what the historical state of my aggregate or all my aggregates were at a particular time. Somewhere some value changed, you don't know how it changed, and you don't know who to blame for who, who changed it, right? This can tell you. Uh, and I'm sure you're all keenly aware, uh, but 2015 is the year that they visited in this movie. Where's my hoverboard? 
Anyway, um, if we at some point note that there's an error or discrepancy in our data, uh, we de debugging or tracing that error is a snap. We can find the, the faulty or conflicting event, know who executed it, when they executed it, and what led up to that bad state. Uh, and then we can emit a new event to patch the issue. And if we want to get even crazier, we could go to a specific point in our, in our data's timeline and then fire fake events in order to simulate alternative timelines, um, which has pretty interesting applications for, say, A-B testing, stress testing, disaster testing. I could flood my system and, and fake a, you know, I don't know, some sort of disaster and see how we hold up. Um, and if any of these past slides uh, remind you of the, uh, I don't know, they did when I, when I pulled them up, remind you of the diagrams of Git, these branching and things like that, that's very astute. Because Git is like a recursive event sourcing. Um, I don't know if you've ever, if you've ever looked at the ref, the ref log, but Git keeps track of, uh, it writes the data as, maybe recursive is the wrong word, but it, uh, it keeps track of every event you make, and then it's in the, in, uh, every commit is an event, and then you can, you can look at the ref log and be able to go back to your, through your Git history and restore your application or your code base to any point in time. And finally, uh, event sourcing is the ideal storage mechanism for business analysis. Because event, because event systems do not lose data, they are future-proofed against any crazy reports that your business analyst may need in the future, right? Suppose, suppose, suppose one such analyst came to your e-commerce shopping cart team asking for, I don't know, all shoppers who add items to their cart and then remove them within five minutes. They want to know who and which products because maybe that user's you know, thinking about buying it and they want to be able to target some sort of direct sale or something to try and convince them to, to finally click order. And with non-event sourcing, the naive way I mentioned earlier of just, you know, our shopping cart is just a row in the database, uh, you might have to then build in some sort of tracking table or mark additional rows with a timestamp, you know, I, I don't know. But regardless, when you deploy that, you then have to wait for the data to gather as users go in and then, you know, add, add products and remove them. But with event sourcing, you write a query for that report, and then, and then what do you have? Well, if you're thinking all of the data, obviously, because it's either there, you're wrong. Because not only do you have all that data, I can tell you, uh, we can generate that report and, for, and to see how it would look at any point in our history. I can see what those products were and who these users were three months ago versus this month. Last year versus this year. Yesterday versus today. And which makes the company and your business analysts extremely happy. There's nothing they like better than a good report. Querying over the events, presenting different views on them, uh, is often called a projection. Um, and this is perhaps the biggest event, or the biggest advantage of event sourcing. I can look at specific events across one stream. I can look at specific event, event types across all streams. And I don't have to query on the properties of our domain objects. Um, we can look for patterns in the event stream. Um, current state is the basic projection. It's just all of the events for a particular aggregate. Um, and there's a good deal else to find. Um, in the shopping cart example, I can find items in a cart for any given date or time range, certainly. I can find what, what, uh, what, what everybody's got in the cart right now. I can find out what everybody had in their cart yesterday. I can find items that were removed for any given date or time range. I can find the average distance between a time a user adds a product and cl clicks order, or adds a product and removes it from the cart. I can find the average rate of items removed versus items purchased for any given time, et cetera. I could go on. Um, a quick third channel example. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, we model the relation between our users and the role and, and their state within our, within our uh, platform, um, which when we first did this, people were like, well, why would we, why would we do that? Um, you know, I just want to know who the, who the current agents are. And that's fine. I can tell you that. I can tell you who the current people within our, within our application are, what their current state is. But I can also tell you which one of us made any state transitions. I can also tell you the history of those state transitions. I can give you a timeline of every, what we call agents, the people that work, that work with us. We can give you every agent's transition within the program. I can give you the average gap distance between when an agent came in and we, and we interviewed them versus when we accepted them. I can give you the average distance for how long an agent lasts before they fire or, the, or they quit. Um, and I can do this for one agent, for all agents, at any given point in time. Still, even after this presentation, if you're still skeptical of the benefits, uh, and you think that this is the silliest thing you've ever heard of, uh, be aware that the decision can be out of your hands. Uh, event sorting is often chosen or driven by management out of business needs, and hacky analogs are often shoehorned into the system after the fact. 
So have any of you ever had to build versioning of objects, an undo action, an audit log, uh, tracking object value changes over time, or anything involving time series data? Because I know I have. This solves all of those problems. And now we get to a particular hairy topic. How am I going to handle all of these events and find what I'm looking for? All right, all queries uh, within event sourcing are often referred to as projections, like I mentioned earlier. Projections over the event stream. Uh, this includes the concept of current state. Recur returning current state is super easy. Um, it's just it's one query. I grab all the events with this aggregate ID, build it up when I have a model. Um, it's pretty straightforward. But other projections can be tough. And so there's, um, what, you, what you end up doing is you rarely query the, the event stream directly at, 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 at real time. But where, rather what you do is you build in the background something called a read model, um, which is, is like a standard uh, relational object that you query instead. Um, something like get me the object foo with ID X uh, maps well to the current state of a project, but trying to, trying to find you know, all users by email address in a pure event source model would be a little hard which I'll get into in a, in a minute. But so for a, re a, a, a read model might look something like, like this. So I have my aggregate, my event, my snapshot tables on the database, and then I'll have another database table which keeps track of the current shopping cart line items. Because I might be building up some uh, report of the shopping carts, and uh, it's much easier to grab it out of there for performance than it is to have to query uh, of the, the event stream every single time a user wants to look at their cart. It's analogous, I think, to a database view. Also, I highly recommend trying out reactive streams for those of you who were at my talk yesterday. Uh, I think they go hand in hand well together, which is partly why I'm talking about both things, because we're doing both of these at the same time. Um, so uh, check out Reactor. It's a great project. Uh, use streams to filter events in code. So if you're building up these, these, these reports or these read models, I find it easier to pull out uh, find it easy to pull out a series of events, do some filtering operations, find out what you're looking for, you know, map functions, put them in different forms, build up some sort of build up your read model objects and persist those. And uh, in fact, uh, there's there's this database called the Event Store database, uh, which is written by uh, sort of the founder of this of this event sourcing uh, movement. His name's Greg Young, and his main project is this Event Store database, and that's exactly what they do. It stores the events the event store database saves all of your events, and then your queries are streams that you write uh, within the database itself. It's a little, little odd. Um, however, as you can probably see, this, is, you know, this might be fairly difficult. Um, your development team will need to spend time writing these projections. Um, if you've got analysts on your team that are used to going in and poking at SQL, they're not really going to be able to do that anymore at, at an effective level. It's going to be much more difficult for them. Um, I also would suggest consider f feeding events into additional services or tools, particularly those that are stream friendly, like Splunk or Storm. So, um, you know, this all sounds great, but what does this look like if I'm trying to implement something like this? So, pure event sourcing is fairly simplistic uh, in terms of, of implementation. Uh, there's three base objects uh, that you really have to worry about. We have our aggregate, um, which just has an ID should be a UUID. Uh, the, current, the current revision number, basically the current, uh, yeah, the current revision number, and the type. Um, so I know when I'm pulling on the database what, what if, I have, if I have a, if I have a uh, model, I can, I can cast it into that. Um, then there's a, f there's a, there's a f I put three events here that, that I find common, uh, or that I find are, are easy to think about how this sort of works. Um, Basically, you need, you need, a, you need a, a, a method for applying new events. And like I was mentioning earlier, distinguishing between uh, the historical approach and the new, the, new, and the new events. So two different methods to distinguish between when I make an event change, um, the two different uh, paths to follow. And then, and then lo loading from a snapshot. Uh, the, event, the event object or the event table, um, ID, revision, type, the aggregate it links to, date, uh, the user who, who made the change, and then a uh, and then some sort of storage or serializ serial serialized uh, variation variant ser serialized of all the data that it, that is that is a pro uh, uh, attached to the event. The slide's kind of old. It's fine, sort of stumbling a little bit because there's a few other properties that that I would add uh, that have come out of, of having of having worked with this for a while. 
One is that, that is missing from the slide is uh, I, I used to t typically add a field called date effective. So there might be a difference that when I'm applying an event that I want, I want to know the date it was written or the date created, but I also want to know the particular time that, it's, that it should be used in the event stream. So if I'm, if I'm trying to create some historical events or I'm trying to do some testing and I want to slip something into an event chain and see what happens, I can, uh, I can mess with the time a little bit. Um, Traditionally, though, the date created and the date effective are going to be exactly the same. Um, all events should be named in the past tense as they should reflect something successful that happened in the past. Uh, lastly, we have snapshot. Uh, again, we want to serialize the properties of the aggregate at that moment in time. Um, and so it looks very similar to aggregate, except it has a big data JSON blob. If you're using Postgres, you can, uh, you can, act you can actually make good use of their JSON data type, depending on uh, what your what your uh, database or what your connection mechanism is. Uh, we use JPA and Juke quite a bit, and, it, and it's unfortunate because they don't actually have a way uh, that I'm aware of to make use of the Postgres JSON data type. If I'm wrong on that and someone knows how to make that happen, please tell me because that would be huge. Um, aggregates and event subclasses have transient properties. Um, and I should be, because I, I should probably be clear about what exactly is being serialized into those data fields. Um, so the aggregates and events, or at least the classes that implement uh, the aggregate and event, uh, contain themselves transient properties, which are essentially, or which are generally not directly persistent in the database. So uh, here's a plain old object with uh, explicit transient properties. So if I'm using JPA, for example, this, I mean, your class might look something like this. Uh, I have a person. It extends this base aggregate class, which has some additional function, to it, which basically has those functions that I showed you earlier on them. Um, and these are all, all the fields in the person are marked as transient, so JPA doesn't try to save them. And the event itself has transient properties whose values are whose, whose values are persisted to the database, but not directly as a column, but rather there's a serialization step that takes all of the properties that I might have in that event, put them into JSON, say, and write that to the database. And then the event has, has a method for knowing what to do with, and this slide's a little bit outdated too, and since updated it's used generic, so I don't have to, uh, cast it to a person every time, um, which knows how to take the data within the event and apply it to, to its object. So, which is a key point, aggregates receive and play events. Um, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get into uh, to what that looks like in, in, in a minute. Um, so, events modify aggregates. Um, it's almost like a visit pattern, I think. Uh, as events are generated, they are applied to the aggregate, and the aggregates are built up, or in the case of loading the aggregate from, from, from history, uh, built back up event by event. Um, when the aggregate is first created, all of those transients are at their default value, and the playback of the events will restore those transient fields to, to whatever point in time they were uh, as the events are, are, are played. I'll, I'll get an example of what that looks like in, the, in a minute. Um, this is going back to your point earlier. Uh, aggregates require distinction between new and historical changes. So the shopping cart and the order placement should only charge their credit card the first time the order event is created, not from not any time I play the event back or load it in memory. So, so the, the events, tend to be, events tend to be very, very small, and then they might have some call into larger business logic that might, that might happen later. Uh, in addition, you'll probably want uh, a service layer to store and load the events in the aggregates. Uh, it can get tricky to sort of deal with all these events and, and stream every single time. So having a simple class that lets you handle that, that, that logic for you is, uh, is great. Uh, and those are the basics. Um, Unfortunately, there's a few practical considerations and, you know, that, that are reality for any real ES system. Uh, and I didn't actually show you exactly what, what, what that code looks like yet, which I'll get into in a minute, hopefully. Uh, so the, after having worked with this for a while, um, we found that the pure form that I mentioned earlier is nice, but a little, also a little naive. And there's a few realities that, uh, that, uh, that, you, that you run into when you start working with this. Uh, the first is that while snapshots sound awesome and essential and everything like that, um, you rarely end up actually using them. Uh, Greg Young, the guy I mentioned earlier, uh, says that you, know, he, you shouldn't snapshot an aggregate until it reaches at least 1,000 events. Um, and if you think about it, most of your aggregates may not get, even get that high. Like if I have a user object that's aggregated, you know, I may have a dozen events in the entire lifetime of that person, maybe less. A bank account, you know, that eventually will hit 1,000, but not for a while. Um, the reason for this is that loading that snapshot is an extra database call. And so if the time it takes to make that extra call is less than 
the time it takes to, to apply those events, then you don't want to do it. I think that's right. Last. Yeah. And you know, basically, pure event sourcing is tough to work with. Um, so as an example, um, I, I intentionally made this slide hard to read to emphasize the point. Um, querying for specific properties within an event uh, is tough. You see that little blob of JSON in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, in the data column? Um, you know, it's, it's, if I'm trying to query this directly, you, you don't, you know, don't want to use like a like query to find what program ID equals that value. You know, that would be, be kind of gnarly. Uh, and so again, early, if anyone knows how to uh, make JPA or Juke work with Postgres' JSON type, you'd be a lifesaver. Um, so there's, I, I think there's two alternatives to the standard approach to make this, to make this stuff a little easier. Um, so there's the, the first pattern uh, is fairly common, and it's called the, uh, I call it the synced pattern. Um, and this involves keeping a standard uh, synchronized current state representation of all of your aggregates. So uh, when I write, but uh, when, when I write into the event log, I then also update the, the domain object and save that. So it's essentially tacking on a journal to your current, uh, you know, ORM-backed uh, GORM uh, model. Um, and it, it is technically a, a read model, essentially. Um, the downside again is that you have to keep these writes in sync with each other. So when I update an object, I also have to write it, write an event, um, which, which which can be a pain. Uh, second, and this is my preferred pattern, is what I call the hybrid approach. Uh, so, I uh, use multi-table inheritance to give, to give each of your aggregates their own table, um, add each of the properties that you'd like to inde index or add database level checks to, like foreign keys. Uh, it doesn't even have to be all the properties. Like my person project may have, my person class may have address and a bunch of other things, which are still transient, but I may want to index on their name or their email to make efficient querying for the person happen later. Um, plus there's, yeah, there's a few more. I could probably you know, talk further, uh, I could talk all day about this, I think but we don't have all day. So, moving on to the next section. Like, uh, what tools are there out, out there for, for working with event sourcing? Whoops. The first thing to, to realize is that there's not really a need for an ORM, I don't think. So you're, again, again your database structure, like this is the, we, we have an app that's running in production and this is the, this is the, the database SQL file that sets up the database. It's two, two, two tables. Uh, some indexes. Yeah, it's not terribly complicated when I'm pulling these objects out. Um, there's not terribly too many event sourcing libraries out there that I'm aware of. It's still sort of a, a new field that's, uh, well, it's not new, but it's, it's just sort of getting popular right now. And there's no real standard that people have set up. There's no book that I'm aware of, for example. Um, there's some, and so there's not many implementations or libraries available to work with this stuff. Uh, the one big one that I can think of uh, is ACA persistence? Um, who is anyone here using ACA at all? Or ACA persistence? No. So the um, their default method for when you save an object, it's it's using event sourcing under the under the, under the hood to write every change to your object uh, in an invisible way, so you, you can't really see it uh, to, to 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 the database. And then when you're working with the objects, it restores them back up uh, from current state. Um, I I'd, I'd, I'd recommend using this if you're on the JVM. Um, the persistence component is also available as a standalone jar, so you don't have to use the rest of ACA if you don't want to. Um, it's pretty slick. Um, when looking for a storage mechanism, there's also many options available to you. It's fairly database agnostic, I think. I mean, you can make it work with with most, um, you know, with NoSQL, with you know, standard relational databases, etc. Um, again, there's there's an official uh, event stored database. Uh, called Event Store. Um, it's highly specialized for working with events and generating projections. Um, it's written by a guy named Greg Young. Again, he's really, really famous. Uh, also, uh, Apache Kafka. Anytime I start talking to, or Kafka, anytime I start talking to people about this subject, someone will immediately go, oh, have you tried Kafka? Um, every time, without fail. It happened 30 seconds before the, before this, the, the, the talk started. Uh, so, Kafka is interesting. It's, it's, we, we, we don't use it uh, prim primarily because you have to, it requires a technology called Zookeeper, which, which I hear is a little gnarly to set up and um, it's not really how we're operating. But it's intended as a message, uh, as a message broker for, for, for doing messaging, but it's also maintaining a journal of every event that, go, that goes through the system, um, which, uh, which, makes it, uh, which makes it also very efficient for, for storing and, and reading events. Um, and of course, you can't go wrong with good old-fashioned relational databases. I mean, we, we use event sourcing a lot in production, and we're just using Postgres everywhere. And it works, just, it works great. 
Um, and you know, if you're already with relational databases and you decide to try something like this, I would say just stick with it because you know, switching to a whole new t database technology at the same time might be too much for, for one go. <laughs> uh, the question was, do you think Oracle is a good choice? Uh, no. <laughs> I just put it up there because I wanted something to fill the slide and I'm trying to think of relational databases and I was like, you know what, eh. <laughs> All right. Any, any, any other questions uh, or anyone want to bash Oracle some more? Yes. <laughs> Great question. A little softball. He actually asked me that before the start and I asked him to ask me that again. Um, has anyone here heard of CQRS before? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, I haven't mentioned it yet uh, on purpose. Mostly, um, uh, uh, and, you know, it's... So CQRS is a, for those who don't know, is an alternate, is an alternate to, I think it's an alternative architecture or something like MVC where all incoming user actions are modeled as a command. And assuming the command is successful, uh, it converts that command into a series of events. Uh, and then the view is not based on a standard domain object, but based on some sort of essentially a read model. Um, event sourcing is a key component of CQRS, um, but I only have an hour, and so it's hard to talk about the whole thing. And the thing that I, I'm more excited about the event sourcing section than I am um, the whole CQRS mechanism. But uh, you know, we, we end up doing sort of a hacky hybrid of it anyway. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Sure. Sorry, what? Great question. So uh, the, the question is, I, I've talked about how I, how I might change the aggregate schema. And so the question is, is the event schema always the same? And would I throw everything in one table? Um, yeah, I f I, we haven't found the need to, to make different variations of, of the event so far. Uh, it's, we, we, and we tend to just throw everything into one go. Like I've got, be, be, because be into one table, because it's an additive only model and I'm never updating anything, I never do essentially a table scan. I never do, uh, I, I never do, I never update in a row, and so it's just throwing things on. And with um, uh, standard relational databases are very good at doing that. We've got, we've got, a, we've got a database that's got something like some crazy number of millions of rows and, of, of just events, and it and it's able to be read from you know in in a very acceptable amount of time. Um, and we we rarely query it directly anyway. Again, we we mostly use re we mostly run some jobs which build. Uh, these read models based on that event stream, and we query those instead. And those still will still even have you know hundreds of thousands of records and things like that. Anything else before I show some code? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and so that's a great question. So uh, the question is again in performance. So that's that's one of the things. That uh, that is, the people start will, will start questioning immediately when I start talking about this. And so the question is, you know, what's the performance like looking at the event stream versus looking at a mutable data type or a read model, as they call it, as sometimes call it. And uh, yeah, it's a great point. Um, you generally, it's it's the performance doesn't come from pulling the records out of the database. I, I don't think it comes from trying to do any sort of queries on them, which is a l which is pretty wonky. And so so again, um, having that having that read model. Uh, is, is generally a huge performance advantage. So if you have something that requires like immediate user, um, the, the user's gonna want immediately, like their shopping cart, you're probably gonna want to want to remodel. If it's something that, you know, you can run in a background job, it's probably fine to just pull out some events and then, again, we, 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 tend, to, we tend to pipe them into a, a, to a, to a stream and then do some filtering and grouping to, to find the queries we want. Marco. Mm-hmm. Right. 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 So that, that, that's a really good point. So uh, as Marco pointed out, one of the key things I left out was, was, was talking about the CQRS is that it tends to involve two sto two, at least two data stores, right? I mean, there's the, as the events are coming in, they're getting written to, this, uh, to, the, to the journal. And there's a separate, oftentimes a separate entire database, which is building up these, these views from, the, from those events, which then are, the views are actually presented to the user, not the events. Perfect. All right. Anyone else? Um, yes, question.
Um, so, um, are, do, do you mean do you mean events that might happen as like a side effect? How do I, uh, so the question is, how do I keep track of all the events? Is that right? Um, so the the events are are all linked to one to one uh, to this one aggregate, and so that that's their that's sort of these the reason it's I, the reason we I, I talked about streams earlier is that it's, I think it's important to think of these events as a stream that are that are all linked together by one common the term is aggregate, but it's essentially one common ID that they're they're sort of related to. So you know that any event that, that deals with that particular uh, aggregate, you know that that that, that if, I'm, if I'm looking at that, I, know I can be I can be assured that all of those events are tied to it. Um, I think it becomes a little bit trickier if you're trying to look across aggregates and you're trying to so to scoop up a bunch of things. Um, so you know, one common thing you might do if, you, if you're trying to build a report of things that are not necessarily all connected by the same aggregate is to scoop up all events for a for a given time period and then build some sort of report based on the events as they come out of the database and you start you know filtering them. I'm not sure if that directly answers your question, but. Um, let me let me show a little a little code. This is this is slightly embarrassing because it's super trivial, but um, I also want to point out is that uh, at Third Channel we're oh that probably helps if I showed it. Is that we're uh, we, we're building a little library. Uh, it's not it's not even like available to use within Maven yet. We're still sort of working on it, but it's coming out. I, I hopefully we'll have a release. What's that? We're well, within Gradle. Sorry. Yeah, I may, I, may put, I may put it up on like J J Center or Venture. Yeah. Thanks for that catch. I totally said Gradle. We're going to go back and, and, and edit the, uh, uh, the, 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 the tape. Um, uh, yeah, okay. So let me turn off. Yeah, no, I know. I got I gotta, I gotta, I gotta a mirror in them. Hold on. How, how about now? Can you, can you, can you, is it good, Dan? Can you, can you see? All right, perfect. <laughs> um, let's see. Where did I go? That's our demo. So, as let me, let me so typically, I set up my projects. Are, it's kind of hard to read. Let me open up some objects. So um, I'm going to start with this product object. This is again super trivial. I did it this morning, so it's so it's not going to be super exciting. But hopefully, it'll give you a little a little uh, a little basis for how some of this stuff might be wired up. Um, I'm planning on also making a, 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 re a reference app to uh, to tool around with different events and things and make it available on GitHub if, if, if anybody wants to uh, to check this out later. As I as I tinker with it, uh, there's there's some links on the slide for this at the end. Um, so typically, so this is a and this is an example of how we might implement a a product uh, or a, a product aggregate. Um, it extends in this case I'm using JPA JPA just because it's just because it's easy. Um, so my my basic aggregate object uh, sets up my inheritance strategy. So I, again, I'm, like I mentioned earlier, I, I like I like this sort of hybrid uh, uh, approach. Uh, I set up my inheritance type for, t for table per class, find as an entity, um, and you'll notice that uh, there's not this, this this particular class doesn't have any transient fields on them. So in the aggregate, I'm writing everything. I've added uh, an additional uh, flag, which I didn't mention in the slide, called active, in case I want to soft delete an aggregate. Um, so going back to product, it has. Uh, Two fields that I want to index on the particular product SKU and the, the product's name for some reason. I don't know why I have that in there. Um, and then I have two transient properties: the current price and the current inventory count. Um, these are these are these fields again are not written to the database, but instead generated entirely by events. Um, if I wanted to to start persisting, say, the inventory on demand and be able to query for that within my my database, I could just remove that and then, uh, of course, update my, my database schema to have that field. And then it, JPA will just start writing it anytime I save this object. Let's see. Um, so an example of what some of, the, some of these events might look like. So I tend to structure, and this is hard to read, and I don't know how to zoom on the left-hand side, but I tend to, I tend to structure my, my little services that, that make, sure, make use of event sourcing by, by grouping some of the, event, the, the, the aggregate specific events into their own package. Um, and I'll have things like the price changed event. Um, and, and you'll notice that with JPA, at least, instead of using the, the table inheritance, I'm using a, uh, the, the discriminator value. So these events are all end up in the same table, and when they come up, uh, JPA knows how to, based on the discriminator value, uh, convert them into the relevant event. Um, events are tied to a particular product, um, 
and the, the, the properties within the event are also transient. Um, and then when the event gets processed, it knows how to, uh, the, the event knows how to update the product. So in this case, it's, it's uh, as the event gets processed on the, on, the, on the aggregate, it updates the price in cents. Um, and as the events, as, 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 let's say, if I have a series of five of these events, um, and I, when I'm loading up the current state, it's gonna go through and again, set this value every, every single time. So I wrote up a quick, and again, I just did this this morning because I figured it'd be worthwhile to show, a, uh, a small sort of example test of applying some of these events to uh, an aggregate. So in a very basic case, um, I might create a new product, uh, give it a skew of test 01, uh, and then if, if within my service layer, let's say, you know, I have a form where the, the admins are going in and they're updating the, the current inventory count and they're changing, they're entering the name of the product, uh, the underlying service, as the command comes in, it's gonna validate that, you know, they typed in a number and not, you know, you know Z or something. And then they, they're giving it a valid name. And then that, that in turn, the, the code's gonna generate two events based on those, on those property changes. Um, it's going to track, uh, uh, it, uh, it, 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 it uses this method called, called apply changes to the product, which processes it right away. So the current in-memory aggregate has these new values. Um, but they're sitting on the, on the object uh, as uncommitted events until I save it. Then this flushes, it, it updates the, the revision number to make sure to, to so, I, so I know uh, how old the, uh, the aggregate is. And then in, within transactional code block also writes those events to the disk. Um, it flushes the, the uh, uncommitted events and then um, you know, everything is persisted. And as part of the service, I've, I don't think I do it in this case, but some of the, uh, within, this, within this save function, let's scroll down. I make use of, uh, make use of some, reactive, some cold reactive streams here. Um, it's basically going through, and just like I said earlier, it's trying to save or update the aggregate, um, serializing all of the events, converting them to JSON, or I'm gonna update this so you can provide your own mechanism to say use JSON builder or use Jackson or something like that. Uh, and then it's you know, combining all, the, all of the events down to a list, and then saving the events all, hopefully all in one go. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. It's not terribly complicated. It's just a matter of the the, the, the key bit here. I think is to is uh, let's see this 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 particular notion that when I want to update an aggregate, I have to check to make sure that the that the revision numbers are in line, and so so events aren't coming in out of order. So when I write to a disk, I want I need to make sure that if I'm if I've applied three events and I was at revision six, I only want to update the aggregate and proceed at all. If there's if there's uh, an aggregate in there at revision six, because if it's not, that means somebody got there before I uh, before I started writing. So you know your common optimistic logging. Let's see. I think I think that's about it. Is there anything else in here that's relevant worth uh, looking at? Um, so this is just one one, qu one quick example of looking at it uh, of looking at it uh, uh, at, at, a, at, a, at a historical point. So this trivial use case. I set, up a, I set up a product, um, I set the name, and then I'm essentially applying a price changed event uh, every day for 30 days. I'm essentially base build, building these fake historical data, and every day I'm reducing the cost by 5%. Just to be like, it's not selling, I gotta you know, bring the price down. Um, at the end of this time, the current state of the product will show me what the, what the current price is, $6.35 but I can also look and see what the price was 10 days ago. Or I can, look, or I can just look at the price change events and see the, the historical change over time. This is, this is just a glimmer, I think, of what you can, what you can ultimately do with this. Um, again, just some quick example I put together, I think during uh, uh, somebody's talk this morning. Okay, I think that's all I have, and I've got about two minutes left, so I should probably wrap this up. Um, so in summary, um, event sourcing is an additive only lossless uh, uh, data storage technique with you know, potentially endless uh, potential for, for doing research and data analysis, but it can be pretty tricky to work with. Um, and it's probably not for your mom's blog or any sort of standard static site like a, like a restaurant menu. Um, and so that's it. So I say, I say thank you, and uh, if anyone has any questions, please let them come. Thanks.